Good, good evening or good morning it is for you, I guess, in uh, Pacific time there. Uh, really good to see you guys. Um, yeah, I wrote to you about 10 days ago or so, uh, or so uh, suggesting that we perhaps do a video because I experienced an interest in the group um, about knowing how this came about, why it came about, this group for the Riddles of Philosophy that has been quite a process for a lot of people, I think, uh, in lots of different ways. Um, and yeah, also, so how it came to be, your your experience of that process, because we met for, there's 18 videos up there. So I think we met, I guess that means we met 17 times because you did an intro. Um, and then, look at um select what your hopes are for or the reasons for like the next group which is on the um, the philosophy of freedom uh, it's like your if it's not your expectations or it could be about your expectations but uh it's like some some thoughts as we enter into another new exciting pro process so um one one of the things that's fascinated me is why on earth did you start? What, what caused you to to get together? And so I think, right, let's have a reading group around the riddles of philosophy. It's, um, yeah, but uh, Matt or, or Ashton, would you? How did this all come about? Go ahead. You first. <laughs> <laughs> we're, I mean, um, we're just always uh, talking about Steiner or, you know, other philosophers. And um, I think the, and we've been talking about um, starting some more intentional um, collaborative project together for a while. And um, at least, you know, as it, you know, specifically in connection with the riddle of philosophy, um, I had been planning to read it at you know, this last semester um, at, as I, you know, just have a whole bunch of different um, texts that I'm planning to read as I write my dissertation focused on Owen Barfield's work and his sort of semantic approach to history. And, um, and so, yeah, when I just mentioned that to Matt, he said, we should read it together. And then um, I can't remember exactly the moment that we decided, oh, let's try to get a bigger group together. Um, but maybe you remember more about that. Well, I, I think, yeah, our motive was, as you described, to share in our, um, you know, love and uh, devotion really to the work of Steiner. Um, we have a, a couple of people here in Sebastopol uh, who are interested in Steiner. There's a bit of a anthroposophical community here. Um, who, who, give us some names. Who, who's that? Just, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't live in the US. I mean, these, the, there's probably household names to select like people in your area, but the rest of us. Yeah, well, a, a, a close friend of ours who also uh, was uh, part of the CIIS um, mm -hmm. community, uh, Jeremy Strawn, he's a... Um, he teaches uh, projective geometry for uh, a Waldorf school, high school in the area, and uh, has taught for Schumacher College. So he's about ten minutes down the road from us. Um, and we we read uh, a book on the uh, on Steiner's uh, social threefolding. Um, what was the hey, name of that book, Ash? Oh. Um... I can't remember something <laughs> social, the mysteries of social encounter or something like that. Dieter Brühl. Dieter Brühl, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, Jeremy got tied up with other things and couldn't join our online group. But um, but yeah, we had this desire to um, just reach out online and see who might be interested in in studying uh, riddles of philosophy with us. I had not read that text before. Yeah. And um, Ashton's in the midst of writing his dissertation, was going to read it uh, for that purpose. And so I figured I'd love to read it too. And we just put the call out 
and the response was um, significantly uh, greater than we expected. Um, yeah, nice. So it was really a lovely surprise to to have. I think we had maybe twelve or so regular participants in the in the seventeen or so sessions uh, for riddles, and I assume that amount or possibly more for philosophy of freedom, uh, which will start in a few days here. So, uh, yeah, it was and just really the desire for, uh, you know, a, a community to study this, these works with. It was actually Stuart Steinman, you know, he's been in our groups like several times. He, he flagged because about six, eight, but 10 months ago, I told him about, I'd seen your stuff on Hegel, which I thought was really, really interesting. And we were we were talking together. So I had told him about your work, and then he got back to me, and so I said, "Oh, uh, you might be interested. Matt is starting this group on the riddles of philosophy." Um, but he he, uh, if I remember correctly, he also said that you already then had plans to do the philosophy of freedom as a reading group, or is is that just sort of like me joining dots that aren't there? I'm not. I don't think that that was the case. I think um, right. okay. it, it did quickly present itself, though, I think within a few weeks. Um, and I think it was partially just because other people were bringing it up. But it was also clear that, you know, the end of the book, The Riddles of Philosophy was sort of, you know, basically opening the space for yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And in the preface to the philosophy of freedom, I think in his 1918 preface, Steiner says, like, you know, I'm I'm republishing this book now, 25 years after having written it. I'm not going to update it based on all the ideas that have emerged in that time time span that might be relevant. But if you're interested in that, check out Riddles of Philosophy, um, mm -hmm. where I do engage with uh, these modern world conceptions. And uh, so we, you know, we chose this order. Um, I don't think we really thought through in detail why riddles would come first um it just kind of felt right and mm -hmm. as we went along that that intuition that we had really um felt uh yeah uh it, like an ideal yeah. order yeah 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 absolutely and and then the actual because I today I was scanning through you've done a lot of videos uh, Matt I, don't, I couldn't there were so many I couldn't count them all and I couldn't <laughs> see a number to tell you but you've had just like two and a half million people have watched your videos in in total you've tried lots of different formats I've seen you two working together lots of in, individuals you've covered so, so so many things but one thing that I did think that I picked up on and you can so like uh, confirm this or so like say if it's another way but it seems to me right at the beginning, so like 11 stroke nine years ago, there was an interest in Goethe and uh, Einstein and uh, archetypal thinking and this type of thing. And then there was a lot of other, it's like interesting stuff that happened. And then from my perspective, it seems like you've returned. Is that the way you <laughs> see it? And, and although the question is directed at Matt Ash, and I'd also like you to sort of like, Where's your history in this? It's like, how, where are you? Where are you coming from? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think Ashton has something to do with my uh, renewed focus on on Steiner in the last few years. Um, but you know, I've been on YouTube for um, quite a while. I think my first two thousand seven. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> maybe even a little earlier on a different channel. Um, maybe 2006 or so, but yeah, around then it's been a while. And, um, when I started graduate school, I, I had already heard of, of Steiner, um, and Goethe, who at that point I was, uh, pronouncing Goethe because I'd only read it. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, graduate school is helpful for these things, but I started, uh, taking courses with Robert McDermott, um, who, has just retired. He's professor emeritus now. And he, um, I took a course with him called uh, Krishna, Buddha, and Christ. And we read uh, the Gospel of Luke and Isis Mary Sophia, uh, a couple of collections of Steiner's lectures. And I was intrigued. Um, and then we, he, he offered another course on um, Rudolf Steiner and 
Teilhard de Chardin, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, uh, that he co-taught with the cosmologist Brian Swim. And we read um, Outline of Occult Sciences and, and Outline of Occult Science in that course. And um, by that point, I was off and running um, and continued to engage with Steiner uh, and to learn more about you know, the Gertian approach to natural science. But then I, I just became increasingly um, infatuated, I guess, with uh, Alfred North Whitehead because I was working towards my, my dissertation and I did end up incorporating uh, some of Steiner's ideas. I mean, really, I, I cite Steiner you know, frequently in my dissertation, but he's kind of in the background mm -hmm. just because uh, you know, it's, it's hard to um, bring him into the academic conversation without raising eyebrows. And so he's there, but uh, in a kind of mitigated form. Um, but when, um, when Ashton and I met, uh, he, I think very quickly, and, you know, I'll let you speak on this, but you became very interested in, in Steiner and then Barfield. And, um, I had kind of moved away from, not that I had decided that I wasn't, um, interested in Steiner, but I had just, you know, followed my interest in, into other areas. Um, but because Ashton became so, uh, taken by, anthroposophy i started you know revisiting a lot of it and for the last several years i think we've been really um amplifying one another's interest yeah you want to add to that ashton sure yeah well so matt came to the philosophy cosmology and consciousness program you know that robert used to teach in he just retired in 2008 right that's when you came yeah. and i came um for the masters in 2017 so you know almost 10 years later. So, um, but before that, I had just finished my undergrad and I was studying film, um, but I was at a liberal arts school. So I was studying philosophy and religion, and you know, a bunch of different um, disciplines. And I, so I was always sort of um, had this overlap between art and philosophy and I guess religion as well. And um, when I discovered PTC and especially, you know, like German idealism through Matt, and I was just so inspired by Goethe. And, uh, and I actually, when I first came to PCC, I, I did, I was very excited when I was first introduced to Steiner, but I also sort of, I've been in PCC since 2017, you know, and so just two years, five years. Um, and I initially, I picked up on, I guess, a kind of the sort of politically charged, uh, uh, I guess, reputation of Steiner, you know, like in the Bay Area. And so I, I kind of, I actually kind of kept it, kept it at an arm's length for a little while until I read Barfield Saving the Appearances. And, yeah. you know, he references in there that one of the, you know, motivations for writing that book for him was to make Steiner more palatable, you know, for people. And that book just spoke to me so deeply, especially uh, after having had a kind of difficult psychedelic experience. And I just progressively felt like anthroposophy helped me to find a kind of cosmological orientation more than anything else I had really explored. And I just, yeah, I just really appreciate Steiner's continuity with the intellectual lineage that I have learned That's, about. Dig, in, dig into that a little bit. I think it's really interesting thinking about other people in our group. So what was it about uh, uh, Barfield or Stroke Goethe that was like so interesting in relation to a psychedelic experience? I was like finding finding some type of grounding. Yeah, yeah, grounding and and like, a, yeah, a grounding, especially in the sense of um, there being something offered that you can practice beyond just psychedelic experience and begin to really yeah. integrate, you know, that we do live in a world that <laughs> is pervaded by that. And maybe there's other ways to live into it without the shock, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's in, sorry, go on, you were going to say, Matt? Well, just on that question of psychedelic experience, I think, 
in the Bay Area and increasingly <laughs> radiating out from here <laughs> to, the, to the rest of the country and, and the world, um, there's a psychedelic renaissance or revolution, a second psychedelic uh, renaissance occurring. And it's, um, I've increasingly, in part because of my study of, of Steiner, um, become somewhat ambiguous in my uh, reaction to it, because on the one hand, I think it opens doors. It opens a door to the spiritual world, but on the other hand, it it does not um, tell you anything about how to walk through that door. Um, and it can, in opening that door, allow influences and, and, and spiritual beings to come through it into this world to affect you in ways that you don't understand. And that can be quite debilitating and, and disorienting. And so I think um, it's a mixed bag. And I think both Ashton and I have found that um, integrating what one can experience having opened that door um, is a whole different ball game. And uh, I don't think anthroposophy is the, the only path for, for that type of work, but it certainly has proven to be um, you know, fruitful and, and helpful for us. Yeah. So interesting. Just you just took me back. Uh, I, I I didn't have psychedelic experiences, but I did go through two years of I, I intensely read between ages of twenty about twenty four to twenty six. I read so much New Age literature, and I got to a point where I was still like just saturated. It was like this is all deeply fascinating. What a, what an amazing sort of like world we live in. But at the end of two years, I was sort of like, and what? And uh, without telling so sort of like the long story, I came into contact with Stein. I sort of like this was definitely it wasn't of my planning. It was there was something else going on there. And very quickly, um, I, I so sort of the particular path I was on, I was like I, I was immersed in it extremely deeply so like very quickly but um, also very quickly came the experience of here i've got a foundation i knew that i knew nothing about it but nevertheless there was a sense in me that i found what was lacking uh so like for me in all of the reading that i was doing about um what's a, it's a new age thinking um so it's, it's, it's quite interesting in the sense that it's creating that foundation, a, a sense of security uh, in oneself, or, or a sense of permanence, I suppose, a little bit in the riddles of philosophy, we talked a lot, a lot about this, I experience, so like separating self off, it feels um, somewhat akin to what's being described in that, uh, in, in, in the process of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so how has the process been, uh, Ashton? So what, uh, if you, if you think about it's like how the group, so you, you've, you've told us you've been surprised, pleasantly surprised at how many people were, um, willing to take part. What have been so like some of the things that have happened or been said that have so sort of like surprised you? Uh, or is there, I don't know to what extent you go into when you started this, I don't know to what extent you had expectations, but um, there will no doubt be things along the way that happen when you go, whoa, <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I don't, I, yeah, I didn't really have expectations. Um, uh, but I guess I, I was pleasantly surprised by just the the depth and breadth <laughs> well especially the depth of um i guess knowledge of anthroposophy that so many people had who did participate and um you know as well as you know the breadth of spiritual experience you know that was shared um and uh yeah i just was i was happy to learn from other people you know in a way that i i didn't necessarily I wasn't, um, yeah, I wasn't counting. I mean, I didn't know, you know, who, how, we didn't even know how many people would want to participate or if, if anybody already involved in anthroposophy would want to just read a book, you know, with us. Yeah. So, yeah. What about you, Matt? I think, um, I don't know if it was 
surprising, but just fascinating that um, those who who did join our group are um, quite diverse in their um, in their orientations and in what's what's drawing them to Steiner's work, varying levels of familiarity. I mean, some are quite steeped in it, like like you, Angus, and others are um, quite new to it and and very much, um, you know, in a state of disorientation and looking for some source of, of grounding. And um, hopefully they found some of that um, by studying with us. And, and, you know, what was lovely was just because of that, uh, because of the diversity of perspectives, I think we were really able to avoid getting um, too uh, locked into uh, one particular angle of approach to the material. And it was, um, you know, people would share um, all sorts of different insights and, and stories and dreams and so on. And so in those videos, hopefully there's something for everyone, you know, um, and I found it really valuable to to record them and to make them public because um, it keeps it alive. Like even after we finish the group, it's actually still going for whoever ends up watching these videos at any point. Um, you know, and and hopefully people will continue to reach out uh, to us to to comment, to to add, to um, to carry forward that work. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the philosophy of freedom, no doubt. Um, there will be other uh, exciting uh, contributions that that people make. I, I assume we're going to have some new folks joining us, and um, it's a different kind of text, though. So no doubt it will be. Um, I I would hope, and and our intention is to have this group be more focused on the text because of how it was written and the purpose it was written for uh, as a kind of spiritual exercise. So my assumption would be. That it will it will be an even more potent um, experience this time around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my, my own experience is that uh, there, there is there's a thirst out there, and there's actually a lack of an ability to people who are interested in Stein and Stroke and the philosophy. They're so it's like thin on the ground, but when something like your community pops up. People's like sen people are sensible. Here, I've got a chance to actually at least interact with people in a way, and so like, and uh, test my thoughts, be together with a group of people, which somehow so like share a similar world's view, even if we we're unclear about so like where those where those similar similarities lie. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it's uh, I've been deeply appreciative of uh of what you've done i did try to engage with another group prior to prior to yours about a year or so ago um but for different reasons that that didn't work out whereas the the community that you guys have managed to create it really there's a real sense of there's a genuine interest it's from from lots of different angles and there'll be people that you agree with more in the group and disagree more within the group but as you as you were saying you've got that diversity of opinion there which is so so important and people respecting each other even if they if they don't agree let people talk say say what it is that they have to say and then the next person so mm -hmm. comes in there. yeah and it's been great to see the sort of um spin-offs uh which have occurred you know the 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 sessions that uh you and uh and jeff and jonathan and uh sophia who i was yeah. pleased to, to to hear from um those have been great. Ash and I have been watching uh, some of those sessions that you've uploaded. So it's it's exciting to see what's being spawned from this. And you know, I don't know what what will be next after the philosophy of freedom, but um, I assume you know this will continue. And you're already thinking that you've you onto a good thing here. Would like to somehow continue it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I definitely think that it would be, it's like, a, again, at some sort of future st uh, stage, it would be lovely to talk more in depth about, okay, we really do have a bunch of dedicated people here who are really serious about this, mm -hmm. um, in prepared to invest time and perhaps even money in, in this type of project. Is there something that we can do together? So I think this, in that, I also see this community building Mm -hmm. uh that initiative that you are at the root of which i feel so 
so positive for me mm. um and and basing it in the english language as well it's like it gives it that international reach that although there are some very competent german people and and italians i've discovered some really amazing italians in that area but the language is english if you want to create these communities um and so and to the best of my knowledge you, you might know better than me but i haven't seen anything like this Am I right or am I wrong? Well, um, I think when it, there, there are, I, I guess, do you mean like in the world of anthroposophy or just? No, I mean, so like specifically your, your format. Anybody who's interested in reading the so like a book and <laughs> philosophical books together, so okay, let, let, let's get online and have a chat together. I guess I haven't seen that either, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. when when you both were speaking earlier, I was just remind I it just the the um the character of the group uh it you know the way you were describing it um it just it it's clear to me that it's a sort of uh extension of what we experience in the the philosophical community of PCC, the Philosophy Cosmology and Consciousness program which is even though it's not, um, anthroposophy is definitely like a thread or a stream through that, you know, mm -hmm. organism or whatever you, whatever word we want to use to describe it. Um, there's this, uh, there, I think what's especially similar is this mutual commitment to a kind of holistic world picture and a kind of moral commitment to uh, you know uh, realizing a more humane <laughs> social body and um and 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 how that's just reflected in the in in the sort of mutual respect for difference the difference of perspective and you know that's you know in the first uh sections of the philosophy of freedom you know steiner's talking about how just that's sort of central to our time right that that uh respecting you know the need for individuals to arrive at an inner experience of truth themselves rather than be compelled to it and there's something about i think the format too because i think one of the things i was initially surprised by i guess like you know that as we've been speaking it's more clear to me i think i was thinking that me and matt would be more like um that it, I guess that there wouldn't, I, I wasn't expecting the, the strength of the group uh, as I've been delighted by it. And I'm so happy about it. Um, but yeah, I guess I felt like we would be carrying it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, anyway, I just kind of. Yeah, so, sometimes it was difficult to get a, a word in edgeways, wasn't it? <laughs> so right. many people wanting to talk and so it's a healthy discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and it, you know just a a broader reflection that over the last several years with the the pandemic um a lot of a lot more anthroposophy has gone online uh and there's been more um of a digital community community at a distance um that has that has grown um you know ashton you've done a lot of the uh as you care do um sessions over the years with with lisa and um i think that it's this is another expression i think of the way in which um this new digital age while it presents challenges obviously to the cultivation of um, one's spiritual life it also uh, and and to social uh, coexistence mm -hmm. but it also presents opportunities and i think i really and and i think you agree ashton want to to lean into and have been leaning into this this domain in an attempt to humanize it. Um, social media is not exactly a wouldn't wouldn't characterize it as a friendly um, place uh, or an, an especially um, intellectually or spiritually enriching place on the whole, but um, it can be if we bring our intention. 
uh, to it. And so, you know, one way of looking at what we're trying to do here is to um, just bring a new kind of energy into the digital space to show how the type of international um, human feeling can be cultivated in this space. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that in addition to the intellectual diversity that that we've had that we'll get you know other kinds of diversity too in, in the group as as we move forward um i think that will certainly enhance uh what we're trying to do but um but yeah i think it's it's really important for people interested in anthroposophy not to just shun the digital space or technology in general but to to recognize that uh it's here and it's going to increasingly be here <laughs> and so if we ignore it we're just you know going to allow it to uh continue moving forward in that unfriendly um asocial or or antisocial uh form and so let's you know i really want to lean in and, and and try to transform the, the digital space as much as we can with with this um more loving uh intention i'm showing people that there are people out there that are really trying to grapple seriously with this with the multifarious problems that there are in society from from various levels. I was thinking when you're talking about like the digital space, uh, one of the people that I find particularly fascinating is obviously somebody like Joe Rogan, who reinvented the long format. Mm -hmm. I do. There, there, there is a serious people or people are interested in digging deeper into things. I, I think there's a there's a visceral sort of like mm. to a lot of social media because it is sound bites, but there are I do I do believe there are a significant amount of people out there in the world that are interested in informing themselves, learning, and where mainstream and a lot of social media fails, there's there is a space for um, people like Joe Rogan, obviously, but also for developing. Um, what what yeah you guys have started off with the with the group here the possibility of long detailed discussions that yeah for perhaps ninety five percent or whatever it is they're just like no <laughs> way where's the interest but it doesn't matter because if you find that group of people who really are interested as you were describing with the energy of the group they come together and there's this there's this uniting of forces and special things can. Um, can, can start to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think as someone who is in higher education um, and very much believes in the potential of universities, I also recognize that that whole endeavor is um, being transformed. And in some ways, the traditional degree seeking um, at least for certain disciplines, like all of the humanities. Uh, I don't know how much viability it will have moving forward. Um, and so I think that we need to imagine um, other ways of cultivating that type of learning. And I, obviously, I think it's obvious it's going gonna, it's gonna to take place online and it's going to be mm -hmm. based on just free association and not... Uh, tuition i mean you know money will, money is always involved so people need to support themselves but um the university system at least in the us is so, so overpriced and again if you're not studying a stem field what is that degree really worth in terms of uh you know career and 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 job uh placement it's worth something intrinsically because of um what you learn and how it how it shapes you but you can do that without getting a degree you know you can do that online i mean so many people now are just autodidacts who listen to hours of podcasts every day on various topics and are hearing from experts and i think there are dangers to that but there's also a lot of um positive things that come from that right and so i think we need to find ways of um, engaging in education without losing the rigor and the, um, the, 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 the discipline and the, um, what the, the ability to, uh, 
to filter and, and sort um, the wheat from the chaff. And um, not that everything one learns in a university is necessarily, uh, you know, true and good and beautiful, but the internet just provides such a buffet of information that, you know, you could very easily get addicted to junk food. <laughs> yeah. uh, so. yeah. and it, you come and come around to this it's like important way right? it's so much then becomes like the the intentions of the individual is it just to so like to have a piece of paper to show that i'm educated or does it come from so like a a deep inner desire to so like somehow to so like approach this uh, truth question mm -hmm. it looked like you were about to say something um, uh ashton or today well i was just thinking that um you know in connection with what you were both saying that I think one of the, the virtues, I guess, of the academic context is that there has at least been historically a, you know, a, a social or a communal com community expectation for excellence and, you know, like peer review or just that there's a standard um, uh, of critical thinking. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways that's really failing in academia today, but I think that's probably what's sort of missing and maybe maybe um, becoming what needs to become more present in this more wild west online sphere. Uh, yeah. uh, there just needs to be good examples of, you know, groups or individuals who can examine, you know, whether or not their biases or, you know, whatever their audience capture is impacting what they're putting out i just hate this this uh this phrase content creator you know like i, I know it's, it's 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 like you know it's not just totally bad but to me what's implicit in that phrase is is not a um a prioritize a prioritizing of the truth necessarily you know and um mm -hmm. anyway just a thought mm. yeah yeah, but peer review in academia is definitely. Boring. I agree. I agree. <laughs> but it, there's at least the ideal, right? Of yeah. peer review, you know. Yeah, and it's just money on social media. Yeah, there's such there's so many perverse incentives because there is peer review on you know how many likes do you get on oh, a particular yeah. post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's not exactly what what you mean by peer what what, what we would mean by peer review ideally, where you know the judgments are being made on um you know moral and intellectual grounds and spiritual grounds not on entertainment value or you know yeah. um anything like that though it's you know not there's anything wrong with being entertaining and edifying or what have you but um there's still a challenge given the way that a lot of these networks and you know YouTube has been around for a while and it has its problems, but I think it's um, at this point, the, 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 the medium that I feel most comfortable with because of, um, you know, the, the long form dialogue, dialogue type um, format that it, that it affords. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's been heartening to me to see, like, I think my most, uh, popular video is on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Like so many people want to know what the hell he's talking <laughs> what is about. This? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, okay, interesting. Um, <laughs> wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> but yeah. hmm. so, so looking looking to the future, one of the things you told us about is that you actually wanted to. So like somehow branch off with so the next set of videos that we're doing in the group for the philosophy of freedom you've you're peeling it off your uh, describe to us what's 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 going on there and um the, the the thinking behind it well um my thought was on the one hand i think it's very valuable to record and, and share these um reading groups publicly for the reasons i expressed earlier to sort of keep it alive even after we have finished. Um, but it seems like this is, at this point, built up its own momentum as a unique project. And, um, I, you know, Ashton and I both felt that 
it should have its own home on on YouTube so that it can become, you know, even more collaborative than it already was. Uh, A stronger focal point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the audience will build up and, um, you know, I think I'll, we'll all be sharing it on our other um, channels and, and outlets and whatnot. Um, but I think I didn't want to have, um, you know, things that I was posting on my channel, uh, you know, affect people's reception of uh, what we'll be doing together reading the, the philosophy of freedom. Um, I just, yeah, I felt, it felt good to, to distinguish the two um, mm -hmm. projects. And, um, you know, despite the fact that the, the videos of our riddles of philosophy sessions were, were getting a lot of positive feedback and um, a lot of people followed along through all 17 or 18 sessions. And hopefully, you know, they'll come over to this other channel. And I think, you know, Ashton and I are, are, um, really wanting this channel to be more collaborative and um, I think what we have a plan to create like a, a playlist to share of the videos you've been doing on the exceptional state and uh, to make it kind of a hub for this project um, so that it can continue to build momentum as its own entity and, yeah. and see where it goes yeah what did you uh, is there, there any, any sorry go on I'll let Ashton first and then I've got a yeah I was just going to ask if you if you wanted to add anything to that Ashton no, I don't have anything to add. I think you said pretty much. It, do you see anybody doing anything else on YouTube or with, with sites where you sort of think this is sort of somehow a model of what I'm, what we might be interested in creating, or is it sort of still completely, completely? Well, you haven't haven't even sort of like got that far in in your thinking. I could share. Uh, I, there is a philosophical community called the Stoa. Have you heard of that? No. T tell us about it. Uh, well, I've only. So, uh, it, it's like community run. I think there's like a um, one, a, a couple major people, people like Peter. Um, what's his last Lindbergh. name? Lindbergh. Um, but it's. Uh, they have a YouTube channel and they'll have like different kinds of. I think sometimes they. They they'll they have like a speaker come, and mm -hmm. present. will have like a group conversation, and so that's 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 the first thing that comes to mind. And there's like a similar ethos, I think. Um, but I think they're especially inspired by the Stoics. Um, and but yeah, I don't see I haven't seen anything particularly you know arising out of like anthroposophy i mean there is like there are communities that i'm aware of that are you know sort of associated with an individual who's like working with steiner or anthroposophy but um not that not that i don't know of any that seem especially decentralized mm -hmm. uh, and have like an actual youtube channel yeah yeah i'm glad you mentioned the stoa that's a really good example it's not exactly like what we're doing it's not a reading group but yeah. um Peter, who started it, was a student of John Verveke's. Uh, and I think it started during the pandemic just as a way of trying to stay sane by forming community with each other on Zoom. And um, they've just kept it going for years now. And there's they've had, you know, everyone from Noam Chomsky to um, ContraPoint. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> now we win. Yeah, that, yeah. That, you, that, you, that would have been a, a feather in your cap a while back, but um, nowadays, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, so that's a good, uh, a good example. But in terms of reading groups, I haven't seen much. I haven't really searched on YouTube to be honest. But there's something really dynamic about having, uh, you know, a, a dozen or so people engaged in dialogue. I would love to watch more of that on YouTube. I mean, two people in dialogue is great, but when you start to increase the numbers, it's so much more dynamic and, yeah. you know, watching the recordings over again, there's so much that you miss when you're doing it live that, you know, cause you're off thinking about what someone's saying and you always miss yeah. what, what is being said in the, in the meantime. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, I think what we're doing is pretty unique actually. I, I, I do. Uh, I think one of the words that I used 
when I, when I formulated the email, was like creating archival um, material. I do think um, we are we, we're going for history is always interesting, but we're going through a particularly interesting period. People don't write letters anymore, but this this is the this this can be the type of archival material that people like look back on saying this is where they were in their thinking. <laughs> uh, but back then, this is how they battled with the questions, and instead of it being like it's like a, a long text that you've got to wade your way through, you're seeing so like all the multiple perspectives, and it creates the dynamism um, that you were talking about there, uh, mm-hmm. Matt. Really, really brings it to life, and you see it how people behave in the video. So like the ones who 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 are full of life, that's like the, the calm ones and how, that's, <laughs> how their f- philosophies are like reflected in that as well. It makes it a an engaging experience. Yeah, that's one thing you know that you know has been part of the delight is like the characters basically. You know, there's like yeah. consistent, you know, over the, the people who continue to show up. It's like especially you know when we were reading the riddles of philosophy where Steiner was sort of bringing that out of the philosophers themselves that was going over. It, it's a, it, you know in sitcoms when you're doing it's like right, writing for um, these the, uh, the sitcoms you have to have stream characters. We've got them already. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to do any casting or anything like that. So they, they, they come in automatically and it creates that, that life that people want. If we were all the same thinkers, I think it would be, it wouldn't be nearly as engaging as it, as it is. It gives you more to talk about. Um, and, but also the ability for people to, when so like new people come to the channel, they can recognise that certain people are closer to them, and so sort of like feel that they like resonate more strongly with those. But they're still exposed, and this is the importance, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Exposed yeah. to other ideas that so like they don't have to be the same, but they don't have to be in conflict either. Um, there's so like there's an undercurrent where we're so like we're talking the same language. Right. Um, that was about archival and there was one other thing that i was um uh thinking about archival uh and the other thing that you picked up i think it was matt but it might have been ashton but and sorry i know matt you've interviewed a few bigger names on your channel uh i've seen that and i think that's also one of the potentially really exciting prospects that if if pe- if we do uh, manage to create it's like a, sorry to use the word cash don't if we do pre- create a lot of content it, oh. it's like content that's valuable that people <laughs> yeah. see and they're wanting to watch then that sort of thing is going to it's like make bigger names like think oh perhaps it's worth it's like talking on this channel with it's like a, a, a couple of the guys and, and getting it to grow that way yeah um, yeah no, I'd, I'd love that. Um, once we get a few videos out, we can we can think about who we might want to invite. And it's it's always um, a delightful surprise when people reach out and say, "Hey, I'd love to, you know, record a conversation with you." So, um, yeah, let's let's uh, look forward to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a like list of particular anthroposophists that I would like to hear from you know i've been reading some books by adrian anderson i don't know if you've heard of him um and also i would love to talk to dale you know (laughs) yes he was somebody interviewed him i i heard the interview with him it was was also like an hour and a half or two hours hermetics um i forget yeah but that one yeah hermetics yeah i forget the guy's name but yeah um that was a great great interview He's yeah, so ex- really. he's, he just gets so excited. He's, he's <laughs> a, yeah. well, and having read so many lectures, I mean, yeah, multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's incredible the work that he's he's done there. So, um, is you, any any change of uh, things that you're going to try and emphasize more when we move on to the. Uh, the philosophy of freedom is that now that you've had to like your, your your pilot show um are you going to try and to like fine tune it or is it still like more of the same i think it'll be pretty similar um with this one i you know in that email that i sent out um mentioned that i'll just 
give a brief summary uh, for, you know, for each section, just so that there's a bit more of a consistent, and especially with the philosophy of freedom, you know, in contrast to the riddles of philosophy, some of the chapters in that book were really long and, you know, just so much. Yeah, many different thinkers. So yeah, that just a little bit more of a concise introduction will be a, I guess, a bit of a difference. But I think for the most part, it'll pretty much be the same as it was as far as, you know, everybody sharing and what do you do you have anything to add to that, Matt? Um, well, I think I, I said it earlier, but just in Steiner's intent with this text uh, to, you know, draw our attention to our own thinking activity that, that there is a, you know, um, uh, meditative or, um, you know, it's a form of ascesis or spiritual exercise that one engages in when we, when we read this text. And so I think it, um, would, one of our intentions that we were talking about was, you know, really to ask people not in a, you know, overly rigid way, but to ask people to kind of stick to the text and, and mm -hmm. um, reflect on what is appropriate to share, what would, what would elevate the group's understanding of what we're reading. Um, and I think- Make it directly obvious how this contributes to the conversation. Sometimes it was left uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. floating around a little bit, wasn't it, in the group? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's that's the intention, and um, I think uh, you know we're we all had. I think we were mostly working from the same translation. I wasn't especially pleased with the text that I was working from for Riddles of Philosophy. Um, I had a PDF, and it was yeah, like we mentioned several times in our sessions. Hard to tell when Steiner was quoting versus when he was. Uh, writing his own ideas, which I guess we'll, in some ways- You have the same own... problem in, oh, in the... um, philosophy of freedom. It, you really, you have to be ultra attentive in sort of like, is it, who, what, what, what point is he, <laughs> is he making the point or is he using somebody else to make the point? Does he agree? Does he disagree? Yeah. It's... Well, with that question, yeah. But there's at least some indentation when there's a oh, okay. <laughs> block quote. <laughs> in, in my version of riddles, there was no indentation or quotes. So All right. okay. um, this is, I'm, I'm really excited to read this beautiful new uh, 150th anniversary edition yep. of the philosophy of freedom. Um, so yeah, those indentations help. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Um, oh, I've got one question and then a final question. Uh, I told uh, Jeff and Jonathan that we were going to be talking and uh, I, if they had any questions and Jeff was, Jeff's question was, are you going to do live? Oh, that's a great idea. I think we can do that. I think we can yeah. figure that out. I, I like that idea. What do you think? We could have the chat open too. Uh, I, I, I do think and we are completely at liberty to, to like choose the questions but it is a way of engaging more people and actually gauging how many people really are interested yeah. um, and if it becomes a like a fixed fixed time then mm -hmm. again i think it's a, one of these ways of growing a community where even if they can't take part or choose not to take part in the conversation they can still feel part of it by asking questions and I love that idea because people have to varying degrees of um willingness to fully participate so some yeah. want to join the zoom call and get a word in and other people just want to be in the background on youtube watching I think let's let's do that yeah yeah that, I'm excited <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> and it, it, and it, it's one of the interesting things we actually got our first ones the other day it was like whoa but it, it adds <laughs> it adds a new level of dynamism, not that we're lacking in dynamism in the group, but it, uh, mm -hmm. I think if you're, if you're on screen and so like realize you've actually got a little bit of an audience there, it's like, it becomes something else, something else. Yeah, it like opens more. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great point. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Emma. Well, just okay. reflecting on having an audience, um, 
as someone who has to record lectures uh, for my online students when it's just me in front of the camera, it's really hard to do. <laughs> yeah. um, I have to really engage with my imagination of possible listeners and think of the the students in the class. Um, and it takes effort to do that. That's taking away from the you know ideas I'm trying to share. Whereas if there's a live audience, it's just um, it's almost as though a um, yeah, kind of uh, group group soul dynamic uh, helps to helps me to generate the thoughts that need to be heard in that moment. So I think, uh, and it works in the digital environment too, for sure. I've I've experienced that. Yeah, 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 definitely. Cool. Okay, final question, magic wand question. It's like where where you, so you 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 got <laughs> you got a magic wand. You can wave where you are in one year with this uh project what would be what would be on your list mm. Mm. Huh. i mean it'd be it'd be cool if the gertianum recognized what we're up to and shared it in their newsletter or something like that that would be fun that's a possibility yeah. tell somebody about it um well, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. It's been so kind of organic and, um, you know, uh, not super um, premeditated um, a year from now. I mean, I think it would just be wonderful to have uh, a, to the community to expand and especially to have, you know, a consistent um, her, you know, presence during the live sessions and people chatting in and that would just be really fun. So hopefully that just grows. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, this is this is just a um, idea occurring to me now. I honestly hadn't even considered this before, but, um, you know, the idea of a kind of school, online school emerging from this, um, mm -hmm where people can come together to study Steiner's works uh, sounds quite appealing actually. And whether or not, you know, the momentum continues enough for something like that to get off the ground, we'll see. But, you know, this, this is the type of text that uh, I wouldn't mind reading over and over on an annual basis and having new people come in and uh, old people stay on and, and just to continue to develop deeper and deeper uh, understanding of this and, and stimulated by new people coming to the text for the first time. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly other texts and, and lectures and so on could be incorporated, but uh, a kind of online school for um, anthroposophical study sounds fun to me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I just one thing I think, um, you know, as far as like this idea of content creation, you know, I think, um, the I guess the issue right with content creation is whether or not those who are um, viewing the media are walking away from it with any kind of um, uh, having grown in a way or taken something away that they can bring to their actual lives, you know, like, for example, with philosophy of freedom, the actual, you know, stimulus to experience living thinking and to, and to, you know, grow back into an experience of the cosmos as a living being. I think that that's um, my aspiration as far as like, that's one aspiration, right? Because then there's, you know, in, in connection with that, there's the community building. Um, but yeah, that, that whatever we're doing is um, facilitating that hopefully, you know, in ourselves and in others and the others who choose to participate and tune in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, the link between thinking and action, right? That's so important in this book. So first and second part, isn't it? It's yeah. what is thinking and then how do we use it to transform the world? Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I hadn't also, I hadn't thought about the question much before I, before I asked it, but I realized that actually one of the things I have, I, I do have a strong, uh, desire to make this international. 
Um, I, as I mentioned, it's like Germans, Italians that I know of. Uh, there are a few, it's like Spanish, but I, I think there are some extremely competent people um, out there and somehow to open it up so that these like particularly good names uh, so you've got you've got an international enough community that it's like if you it's like, it's like I, for example I identify an, an excellent Italian then Lorenzo it's like talks with them and mm -hmm. it's like uh, uh, brings that in and, and uh, German uh, well I mean I could handle that all if we had somebody who was German who was interested as well mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I find particularly appealing because I do definitely see I see the US as, as the hub there but it, it you, so many people have to work with this in their mother tongues which isn't isn't English um, right. and uh, it'd be nice to have a home for that as well yeah yeah totally and I, I love that idea and uh, it might light the fire under me that I need to uh, expand beyond the English language myself uh, I've been <laughs> improve my German for a while now so <laughs> yeah absolutely okay uh, I think that's uh, uh, great it's uh, nice getting to know you a bit better because we, we haven't we haven't talked like this so like in a group obviously because we've been really focused but uh, I definitely feel myself aligning 100 percent with it's like your your magic wand ideas there so um count me in <laughs> great we got Thank that to look so forward much. to yeah uh, i guess for eliciting this you know from us you know this kind of co-creative container yeah thanks angus